Okay, now on to the very last chapter. Chapter 13, Fine Arts Media Architecture. So just like sculpture is three-dimensional, obviously so is architecture or else we could not walk into a building or a room. So right now we're gonna cover part one. So there's, there's a couple of things that buildings, the look of them depends on, and that is the environment, the climate, and then the technology, including the methods and materials available to any given culture. So for example, if you were in Mongolia and you were a shepherd, most likely you would make your yurt, which is a kind of a permanent tent that can be taken down out of felt and wood, and you wouldn't make it out of ice because you don't have any. And then if you're an Inuit in, um, like Alaska or parts of Canada, and you're in a really cold culture, which by the way, due to global warming, we don't have so much anymore, but back when it used to be cold, people, and there's not any trees around, or if there are, there aren't very many, so people aren't gonna make things out of wood. They're gonna make things out of what's available, and that's snow and ice. Um, if you lived 3,500 years ago, you're not going to build a building out of concrete, most likely. But if you lived 2,100 years ago, you could. So we're going to start in Egypt, and then we're going to travel to the Middle East, and then we're going to go to... America. So get on board and let's go. So we're going to talk about this structure called a mastaba. Mastaba means Arabic for bench and these are like the early pyramids and the first known one is from about 3200 BC. Now these would be um, places where they would not bury the Pharaoh, but they would bury people that were non-royal dignities that probably worked for the Pharaoh. So the materials that they had available were, were um, sun-dried brick and wood for framing. The kind of construction they're using is just known as load-bearing construction. So the way this works is the bricks at the bottom will be wider and longer. And then as they move up, they're gonna get smaller and narrower as they move up. Because if they all stayed the same size and you stacked them, what's gonna happen? They're gonna tump over. So they gradually get smaller as they move up. Um, so like the mastaba, the pyramid, these all employed these basic load-bearing construction techniques where you're gradually getting smaller bricks as you move up. And you're also like gradually, the, um, the way the building is, it just gradually gets more narrow as it moves up. So the mastaba, so this is like a place where they would bury somebody. And they would bury them not like you couldn't just walk in the door and see them. There'd be this chamber where they buried them way down deep. In part, this is to protect them from burglars, or although a lot of fat good that did. So we talked about this a little bit in sculpture, but always when they buried somebody, they would have, like here's a little fake door, there's a chapel, and in that chapel would be the Ka statue. This provided a permanent place for one of your three souls to live. The Ka was always with you, like it kind of walked beside you while you were alive, and it was your vital force, it was your spiritual twin, 
And then when you died, it merged with you. Um, the Ka statue gave the Ka like a, a permanent place to live in. If you were poor or if you weren't royal, then yours would not be made out of a really hard stone. This one is made out of wood. If you ever get a chance to the Manil, if the coronavirus ever subdues and you go there, or pardon me, subsides, then you can actually see a Ka statue, which is kind of cool. So um, the pyramids in Egypt, those were meant for royals. And they're, um, again, load-bearing construction. It gets more narrow as it moves up. They're made out of limestone, granite, and sun-dried bricks. And when they were originally made, they were completely covered in granite, which is reflective. And so the sun would shine off of it. Over time, that's fallen off. Um, they are shaped like mountains, and they're also meant to resemble the rays of the sun. This is so when the Pharaoh ascends into the heavens, they could just go straight up the side of the pyramid. The most famous pyramids in Egypt are the pyramids of Giza. These were built for a grandfather a father and a son. And these are called are built for Khufu, Khafri, and Minkari. The corners are perfectly aligned with the north, south, east, and west. And the biggest one of these is 481 feet tall and it was the tallest building for 4,000 years. So I want to go back to the uh, Mastaba the mastaba, just like the pyramid, because of the way they built it with this low bearing construction, they didn't have like giant rooms. They couldn't because the building would fall down. So they could only cut away smaller spaces into this. Uh, otherwise it would mess with the, the structural integrity of the building. So the pyramid is the same sort of thing. There's not very much interior space. Like I said before, the pyramid allowed the king to ascend into heaven. And, and this is the second soul of the king. First we have the Ka, then we have the Ba. The Ba is like a winged creature and it travels between the living and the dead. So it was a, it was a sum of all the forces that made up your personality. And like during the daytime, it would travel among the dead and then it would come back oh i'm sorry maybe among the living during the daytime and then come back to the to the um the body of the king in the evening so um back then like when the king or the queen or other nobility would die they wanted to assure that they had everything in this life as they they did in their living life. So they would make these um, miniature versions of everything. So there would be like a miniature version of a cattle stable and there'd be people milking the cows and feeding them. And then here's a miniature slaughterhouse. And then here's a miniature granary with the scribes keeping records of everything. Um, so, so there's like a third soul, and at first only nobility could get it, but then later on, you know, like lowly creatures like you and I could get it. So that was like, uh, so the third soul is the ankh or the ankh, and that's the part of your soul that ascends into heaven to become a star. Sorry, I'm adjusting my headphones. I think I have them on backwards. So before you could uh, ascend into heaven, you had to pass judgment to see whether or not you've been a good person. So like you go and there's all these divine judges and there's Osiris and, um, and they take your heart, which is here in this little uh, jar, and then they weigh it against Mott's feather, the goddess Mott. Uh, they weigh it against a feather 
And if your heart is lighter or equal in weight to the feather, then you're a good person. But if it's heavier, you're a bad person. And then you're cast into darkness and your heart is devoured by this monster god named Amut. So like, just like the Mastaba, there would be a false entrance, but there are a lot more in the pyramid because they wanted to deflect these grave robbers. And believe me, there's only like, maybe like two pyramids out of all the, I don't know how many, that have never been robbed. So they would have all these fake entrances. Um, and then they also had like these boat ramps where this boat allowed the deceased to travel by day or night on their journey around the sun, which we talked about earlier. So there's also pyramids in Mexico and Central and South America. And we're gonna talk about the Mayan pyramid. Um, this is Chichen Itza over here. So the, the Chichen Itza has 91 steps on each side, plus an extra step at the top, which equals 365, which equals the number of days in the Mayan calendar. They were like astronomical and, pardon me, astrological and mathematical geniuses. Um, they also like invented the zero. So there's two different kinds of pyramids. Um, there, the Mayan pyramids, there's a pyramid that's strictly devoted to the gods. No one, after it was built, nobody was allowed to go up or down the steps or climb it or go into it or anything. The, um, then there's another one kind of pyramid that was used for sacrificial rites and like the priest and whatever assistants could go up on it. Whoever they're gonna sacrifice, lucky them, they could go up on it, but everybody else had to stand back away from it. So Chichen Itza, the interior is made from mica from Brazil, and the exterior are adobe bricks and they're covered in limestone. And again, load bearing construction, so there's not a lot of space inside. There's a temple on top, there's a little more space there. Um, and so we're just going to talk a little bit about what did they sac use sacrifice. So the sacrifice with the Maya, it was linked to a couple of things. It was linked to creation and death, renewal of the harvest, beginning of new eras, like a new king or a new dynasty or whatever, and the conquering of enemies. So the least common form of sacrifice is they cut out your heart. The more common is they would decapitate you, they would disembowel you, they would tie you up and throw you down the st stairs. Um, uh, sometimes they would like sacrifice young people, but usually they kidnap somebody from another village or they would sacrifice like people you had conquered. So the, so the game that's kind of like, sort of like our form of basketball, uh, which was pits or poked a buck. It was played with this rubber ball and sometimes it was played with a skull of someone who was captured. They would like, they would pit the, like they would, the, they would capture a bunch of people that they, you know, like overthrew in battle. Then they pit them against each other playing this game and whoever lost would get decapitated. And then whoever didn't lose, woo woo, got to be a slave. Um, so there's a, there's a, like structures in, even in Houston that are inspired by these pyramids. Like this one by Mel Chen is inspired by the Egyptian pyramids and has like these cracks in it. This is at the Contemporary Arts Museum. They represent the upper and lower Nile. Um, there is Heritage Plaza downtown, which is like in the financial district. And Mohammed um, Nasser, he was inspired by the pyramids at Chichen Itza. And this is like as granite covering. Um, 
and then well actually i take that back he went down to the yucatan and was inspired by those pyramids there and then um there's over here's unity church in southwest houston so th so th now we're going to the to iran iraq that area and we're going to talk about the ziggurat which comes from an assyrian word zakaru it means to build high and it's it's also is meant, meant to resemble a mountain the home of the gods and the one we're going to talk about is an ancient mesopotamia which is also like that area of, of like of iran and this is the this particular one is the great ziggurat of uruk in sumer and it was built for king Urnamu in 2100 bc in honor of the sky god inanna so again low bearing construction kind of gradually gets smaller as it moves out they use sun-dried brick it's mortared with bitumen bitumen is a petroleum byproduct that they would use and they would light it like it would have this kind of like eternal flame but they also used it to mortar the bricks together and this temple had i mean this the, the ziggurat had on top of it a pyramid which is no longer there had administrative offices they stored food and then distribute them out to people um they like at, when it was built it was it was painted it was there was like this white temple was on top it was built by 1500 laborers they worked 10 days a week for five years 10 days a week ah 10 hours a day seven days a week for five years sometimes they'd get paid in beer how do you like that job and then in the center of the i just pointed at it like you can see me point in the center of the temple these conduits would pump up bitumen that petroleum byproduct and they would light it so there was eternal flame in the center of the building um so the city where it was built uruk was the first city in in recorded world history it had a population of forty thousand, which is a ton of people back then and they also in in this area they invented writing so the there, there are these uh it was called cuneiform so it's like these pictographs and there were these clay tablets and they would write on them and they'd also have accounting on them they would use them for pay slips to ration food and to give those guys that beer that they needed um inside the t temple they found animal sacrifice bones and only priests were allowed in here and sort of around this area all around the the ziggurat they found these statues and these statues were commissioned by the elite and they were placed in the temple and the, the what they did is they acted as a surrogate for you so you always like you wanted to make sure you were there when the god arrived in the temple and you, since you couldn't be there all the time these statues would be there these statues had these big wide eyes so that they were always awake and alert and their hands would be in prayer so they would they would pray to and greet the god when it appeared so now we're going to go to north america to southwest colorado and we're going to go to spruce tree house which was in use between 475 to 1000 ce so the materials what they had available the sandstone brick it was mortared with mud and water and again load bearing construction but they also had what was known as a crib roof and i'll show you that in a minute so th there would be like within these would be um this is where the pueblo people live the navajos called them anasazi which means foreigner but they say pueblo people find that offensive um so it had a quarters living quarters for like 130 living quarters there were storage areas and there are eight kivas so kivas are these structures see the there's a ladders here that they grow go underground and they have these sacred rites in them so the kiva that means the world below and it's a sacred 
ceremonial chamber. In the kiva, there would be a hole. And the hole is where they believe the sipapu is where the ancestors arose from. The materials that they had available to make this was wood, stone, and clay. Again, load-bearing construction, but also see this roof. This is called a cribbed roof. It's made out of wood. So the, the, the kiva would be used for men's secret rituals like warfare, rain making, healing, hunting. And then women were allowed to go down there to bring food, but they also had secret rituals which involved food preparation for sacred ceremonies. So all of a sudden, you know, people were living up there, they lived up there, they lived up there, and all of a sudden, it's totally abandoned and quickly abandoned in, a, in around the 1400s. And we're not, you know, like there's bowls with food left over in them. People were in the middle of eating. Um, we're not sure why, but they think there was a civil war because around the, these areas they find evidence of scalping, face removal, decapitation, and cannibalism. So um, the next, now we're going to Greece. Get on the boat and let's go to Greece now. And we're gonna talk about Lionsgate. Now, this is also using load-bearing construction, but in the entrance of this, we see a special kind of load-bearing construction known as post and lintel. Now, post and lintel was kind of cool because it allowed for slightly bigger openings in walls. Um, the stones at Lionsgate, they're giant. These are like gigantic stones and it's known as Cyclopean masonry. And the reason why is because people believe that only a giant like a Cyclops could pick these up and put them in place. This shows you how big they are compared to this person. So, so Lionsgate is in Mycenae, Greece. And Mycenae is on the mainland of Greece. And it, on the gate originally, there were these two, these are hot reliefs, sculptures of lions. The heads have been knocked off. And like the lions symbol, like again, like I said, there were lions all over the place back then. And um, they, like, we're, just, we're always guessing what things mean, but we are guessing that they have to do with power and wealth and that maybe they were to protect the people in there, to inspire fear. Maybe they merged a couple of cultures. We, we really don't know. So then, oh, let's uh, go across and we have to go through the channel from France into England and we're going to Stonehenge now. The Stonehenge is in Salisbury, England. Some of, some of the stuff on this PowerPoint are gonna be a little off and I'll correct it. So these were built in around 3100 BC, not too sophisticated. They're made from Saracen stone and four toned blue dolomite, not dolomite, dolerite. They're not, they are not built by the bigger folks. This has since been disproven. These are built, actually like people traveled from all over uh, the British Isles, from Wales, from Scotland, from Ireland, from Britain to build these. And they also travel all over there for ceremonial rites, which I'll talk about in the middle, in, in a little bit. So again, these used post and lintel construction, um, and they were associated for a burial site. This is incorrect here, because they found since then, circling all of this, these like burial grounds for, I think it's something like 67 people and they tested their DNA and they're all related. So they're thinking it's like the royalty that they buried around there. And then um, they, again, scratch out beaker folk, but they did use cow pelvises and 
deer horns to dig this channel that goes all the way around it. You can sort of see it here. And then on the opposite sides of it, like kind of far away, they're what are known as hill stones. And now, now it's 67 stones, not 56. They're aligned with the rising sun and winter and summer solstice. And then there's the bodies. And, um, and like what they've found around here also is like, um, like, t like the remains of temporary buildings. And it looks like people were like barbecuing and stuff. So um, maybe once or twice, a couple of times, or whenever somebody died, people from all over the British Isles would come and they would have like a burial ceremony, but they'd also like party it up and then you'd hook up with people so you're not marrying your cousin and then you'd go back home. Um, back in the Middle Ages, the people were like, where do those come from? And they made, totally made up a story that the stones were transported by magic from Africa by giants and then um, and then they were they thought but this is not true that they were placed there could to commemorate 3,000 Brits who died in battle fighting the Saxons none of that's true also oh yeah so first the giants bring them I forgot that uh, part the giants bring them and all of a sudden Merlin the magician goes doo -doo 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 -doo, and then the stones all fall on the space at Stonehenge. So there's some disadvantages to post and lentil. You know, they do allow openings, but not wide ones, because if you like take a big old lentil, a giant lentil, let's say there's a lentil this big, and then you only put a post here and a post here, well, those posts are gonna fall down and so and it also doesn't allow for tall structure so what do people do so what they do is they have to invent the column and the like the columns the first known ones were uh, like about before 3000 to 1000 bc and they have found them in asia phoenicia and minoan cultures and they're originally wood and then later people started making them out of stone and marble and bricks and other type of masonry. And again, this is a kind of post and lintel construction, but with columns, you're able to make them higher. So the Minoans, that's a Greek, ancient Greek culture that lived by the sea. They would take tree trunks and they'd invert them, they'd invert them so they wouldn't start sprouting or so the legend goes. And the thing about columns is they allowed, they, they supported the ceilings um, without having to have solid walls. They allowed for a little more open space and more light, and they use less materials than solid law, walls. And they can either be incorporated directly into a wall or they could be freestanding. So at first it was wood, and then people are carving them from these single blocks of stones or bricks covered in concrete. And then like um, to Im increase the height, what they did was they would have a like a supporting wooden or stone column in the middle. And then they would stack these masonry columns. So there's three type of Greek and Roman columns. There's more than three kinds of columns, but we're only talking about these. There's the Doric column the Ionic Column, and the Corinthian Column. And now I'll go into details on those. The Doric Column, this is a capital right here. And the capital is smooth. And below it is a square slab. And this is the shaft. And with the Doric Column, these are fluted. They have ridges in them. They have 20 ridges in them. And with the Doric Column, the shaft at the bottom is wider than they are at top on the top and the roman version of these is is more slender i'm not going to go into that you can read about this so in houston we have doric columns just down the street from u of h downtown at the islamic dua center so now the ionic column the ionic column has what are known as volutes 
or eyes. These are more slender than the Doric. They have 24 flutes or they're smooth. The base is ringed and it can be placed on a square slab or it could just be placed directly on the ground. They have like they're inspired by these ancient Assyrian columns that had these rams on them and also these volutes down here. Um, so Athena, uh, like this temple of Athena Nike, it's named after the goddess Athena Nike, who means wing victory. And um, so Athena Nike is actually like two goddesses merged together. So there was Nike, daughter of the river Styx, goddess of the underworld and hatred. Nike had these siblings, which were Zelos, rivalry, BF force, and crater strength. Athena is the goddess of wisdom. And when you wrap them all together, you get Athena Nike, goddess of victory in battle. So like originally the statue had a head on it. And then the Athenians went to battle. I forget who they were fighting. They lost the battle and the, the statue of Athena got knocked over or else the, the victors knocked her head off. And so the Athenians were like, well, Athena must, Nike must have flown away. The next time we're gonna put a statue in here, we're not gonna give her any wings. So there are ionic columns at the US Custom House, which is around the corner from UH downtown. So the last kind of column is the Corinthian column. The Corinthian column is really fancy. It has this, a lot of times they're made out of marble. They have a super fancy capital. It's really ornate. The shafts are fluted. The base is round. The Greeks used them for exteriors, but the Romans, who loved everything about the Greeks, they used them in the interior places. If you get a row of columns, whatever kind they are, that's called a colonnade, um, the design for the Corinthian column, what was this design was uh, something that a uh, a sculptor and an architect named Kalimokos came up with. So one day he went to this place where they buried people. And this, like, he must have gone there more than one day or the story wouldn't work. So he, he's like, so what they used to do is when somebody died, they would take um, Kalithos, this kind of a vase, and they would put like things that the person who died, stuff they loved in it. So this young woman died and her nurse um, carried the calathos and put it above where she was buried. And then within time, this ancanthus plant started growing up around the calathos and Kalimokas said, I'm sorry, Kalimokas said, wow, I love the way that looks. I'm gonna copy it and use it as inspiration for my Corinthian column. And that he did. So there are also Corinthian columns in downtown Houston at the Harris County Courthouse. So the thing about columns, they, you can get a taller building, but they, it takes too many to hold up roofs. It limits the size of the usable space. So you might have a building, but then it's got like a, thousand columns in it and there's not much space there. So this leads us to the arch. So the ancient arch it was used by the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, and the really ancient ones were kind of small. And they were used for small storage buildings and they were used for underground drainage systems. And there was a disadvantage to them because you can't make them too tall, and you're having to use these really heavy materials to construct them. So the Romans, they, they came up with, with a solution. They had invented concrete, and they started making their arches out of concrete. Concrete's really strong. 
So they invented this concrete in the third century BCE. It's, and the advantage is it's, you can make arches out of it and it's strong and it can be, you can pour it into wooden molds and it's cheaper than carving stone and it can span great distances, like greater distances than the ancient columns and arches. The, the arch has a keystone in the middle and, um, and then has these vosures. You don't have to know this stuff. But you do know have to have to know that the thirst thrust of it ex, is exerted ex, exerted out from the keystone and down, so it makes it like you get you know these like giant openings now. So um, so that's the Roman arch, and Roman arches were were used to build aqueducts. This is the Pont de Grand Aqueduct Bridge. So an aqueduct, it's mostly underground with the exception of, of, of a toll bridge section, which crosses, like might have to cross a river and allows people to walk across it. And it, the aqueduct kind of starts out high and then it gradually, gradually gets lower and lower and it carries water from one area, from a river to somewhere else that maybe doesn't have a river or from a spring. So for this particular aqueduct, the Pont de Grand, um, it carried water all the way down to Nimes and it provided, those aren't supposed to be periods, they're supposed to be commas like, um, 8,800,000 gallons a day to the city, to its fountains, its baths, and its home. And then the Romans, like, um, they built those all over Europe. So, like, uh, when they're in underground chambers, they're, they, well, I'm sorry, the water from these aqueducts are stored in these underground chambers called cisterns. And we, we actually have a cistern in Houston. I've never been, but you should go once all this crap with the coronavirus is over. Um, here's a Roman arch. The bridge over Buffalo Bayou has one. So when you take two of those arches and you connect them, you get a barrel vault. These were also made by the Egyptians, the Babylonians, and the Greeks. And again, at first, they were just used for storages and storage and tombs and underground drainage systems. But then the Romans, because of concrete, they, um, they could make stronger vaults. Well, let's, before we talk about the groin vault, let's talk about the barrel vault. The barrel vault, two arches connected end to end. The barrel vault, it doesn't allow for openings. So like not very much lights getting in. It's just at the front and back. And if you build it too tall, you have to buttress the side. That's, that's these extra structures. So you're using a lot of material. The groin vault is when you take two barrel vaults and you intersect them. So here's a Roman arch, here's a Roman arch, here's a Roman arch, here's a Roman arch, two barrel vaults. It allows for less materials are used. They're stronger. They let in more light. Um, that's the groin vault. So that's really was an improvement. Um, so the Colosseum, I'll let you read about this in the chapter. It, it uses both um, Roman and groin vaults. Um, and I just want to mention, so the bottom of the Colosseum had a floor back in the day. The floor was covered in sand, sand and Roman is means arena. That's where we get our term arena from. So there's barrel vaults at the co-cathedral of the Sacred Heart that's on St. Joseph. Um, there, there are groin vaults in Houston. I, if I search it online, I can't find it, but I know they are like one of the light rail stops is near groin vaults at, um, I can't remember what bank it is, but like there, these are, um, churches in San Antonio and Fredericksburg that have groin vaults. And that's the end of um, architecture chapter part one. And I'm losing my voice. 
and I'm going to record part two later if they let me back in the building. Hopefully, I'll do it next weekend. All righty, everybody. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.